We're going to give our attention to Helen Thackray. She's, she's not Australian. <laughs> she has a, she's a PhD student from Bournemouth University in the UK, and she finds humans and computers fascinating. She'll now attempt to explain some of the psychological group factors behind why hackers are always going to hack. Her theme is, hackers going to hack, but do they know why? Let's give her attention. Hello. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm very definitely English if the accent doesn't uh, give it away for you. Uh, I just wanted to say, when I found out in the schedule that I was following Chris, I was slightly nervous. And uh, then following that, good Lord. Um, but I just wanted to say that's, that's an amazing uh, project. And I just want to give a, another round of applause for it because I think it's such a worthwhile talk. Um, so on to a much lighter topic. Hacker's going to hack. Uh, obviously, you guys have some vague interest in this, otherwise you wouldn't be at DEF CON. Um, I have to say this is slightly surreal for me because uh, last year I was here. It was my first DEF CON. I came to the Social Engineering Village and it, it just blew me away. It was awesome. Um, and I really love the emphasis on education, helping people, and coming here today and listening to Chris's talk, again, it just emphasizes what I do in part of my research, which is looking at the other side of hacking, not just the, the stereotypes, the black hats, the cyber criminals, but looking at what hackers can do um, that, that people don't realize what goes on behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, my name's Helen Thackeray. Um, I'm from Bournemouth University. Uh, I've got my main supervisor, John McElhaney, in the audience. <laughs> If you speak to him, he's a lovely, softly spoken Scottish man. Sometimes I don't always understand what he's saying, um, but we, we muddle through. So uh, just briefly about me, because I'm pretty sure no one's heard of me. Um, I'm a PhD student. Um, I'm at the end of my second year of research. I've got funding for another year, and I hope to finish in that time, because otherwise it's going to get really expensive. Um, I'm from a small, well, I'm not from, but I study at a small town in, on the southern coast called Bournemouth. Uh, I drew a, a red arrow to help you. Um, it's not particularly exciting, but the university makes up for it. Uh, if you don't like the C word, cover your ears, because I'm in the field of cyber psychology. I didn't name it. It's not my fault. Um, I also work uh, with cybersecurity, so I'm in psychology and computing. A uh, brief shout out to the cybersecurity research group headed by Dr. Shamal Faley, who helped with funding for this. Um, other than that, I've got no external connections or funding. Um, it's the university funding this project. So just quickly, uh, I realized I was quite flippant in my bio on the um, SEO, SEO um, the social engineering website. Uh, everyone else was listing all their qualifications and years of experience, and I made a joke about the fact that university pays me to go on the internet. Um, I do have a bit of an odd background. I'm very much the social science and humanities. My first degree was joint in Italian and politics. Uh, the Italian didn't stick so much, uh, but the politics, I got really into political identity, social identity, why people choose the politics they do, um, what unites political parties, and um, the whole personality of it. So with political parties, there's a lot about the, the, the identity of the leader, how they um, present themselves. And I thought, thought that was really interesting. Uh, from that, I moved into contemporary identity and sociology. Uh, and uh, on a slightly different note, I looked at identity in cancer patients. Um, because you, know, you can exist, you, you have your whole self, you define yourself, and then suddenly you get a diagnosis which completely changes your world. Uh, and, and how do you deal with that? How do you deal with people treating you differently? Um, and that was, that was really fascinating. Um, I had some wonderful participants. But it led me to still enjoy uh, social identity and what it is that people um, believe makes them them. How they choose, what they choose, what they do if they can't choose. Um, so how that came about to me studying uh, the internet or people on the internet I have always been a very curious child. My mother uh, told me the story when I was about five, coming back from uh, school, uh, kindergarten. Um, 
there was a house, uh, a door was open to a house uh, on the street that we were walking down, and uh, I decided I wanted to go in it. And my mother said, well, you, you can't just go into people's houses. And I said, but mum, I'm a very rude and nosy child. I'm going in. And, and to five-year-old me, that was perfect logic. Um, I've become less rude about it, but I'm still incredibly nosy. I want to know the answers to things. Um, I also quite like watching people from a safe distance, which sociology, internet research, perfect. Um, also, I really like lurking on online forums. Um, it's a terrible habit. I've been doing it since I was about 13. Uh, weirdly, uh, on an air gun forum was where I started. Uh, and if anyone here is British, you will know how peculiar that is. The UK has very strict gun laws. Um, air rifles are allowed for hunting, pest control, and target practice. Um, as a 12-year-old as a year old vegetarian who loved her pet rabbit, I did not have a lot in common with the people on the air gun site. But uh, I had a neighbor who'd got into it. There were jokes going on. Someone had stolen his team mascot and was uh, sending photos, sending it around the world. It was hilarious. And I loved it, the joke, the in-jokes. So I started hanging out on this air gun forum, um, obviously not talking about air guns ever. But I loved getting to know the characters, the people, the in-jokes, um, how they talked about representing themselves as a whole. And without, without actually realizing it, I was doing sort of ethnographic research on this community. I was sitting there reading about them, learning about them. Um, and to be honest, ever since, I've been finding online communities to do the same things to. I'm kind of creepy. <laughs> so my talk today, um, basically, I'm going to talk about... Uh, a little bit about social psychology, social identity, and then I'm going to look more at uh, group processes. So everyone knows that um, you act in a certain way depending on who you're around. Like if you're with your mother or your father, maybe you swear less than you would with your friends. Um, if you're with your partner, you'll be a little bit more sensitive than you would with maybe your, your brother. Um, it all depends. So basically, social psychology boils down to all human behavior is influenced by the presence of others, either whether it's real or imagined. Um, so for example, standing in a lift by yourself, you might act completely as you want to. You could fart, pick your nose, whatever. Then you remember that there's a, a security camera in the top corner. And then you think, ah, someone will have seen that. You will modify your behavior because you think someone will be able to watch me. Um, and I think one thing that gets forgotten is that when it comes to uh, InfoSec, and uh, cybersecurity is that this is all coming from behavioral actions. There, there is always a wider social context. It doesn't matter what end of the line you are, there are always people behind the computers. Um, and people are fallible um, and open to influence. So uh, one thing that I do find interesting when I talk about my research is that the group processes that I'm going to go through, they're applicable to hackers and people in hacking communities. But they're also applicable to InfoSec practitioners. There are a lot of similarities. Even if you have a very different viewpoint, you've got a lot of the same skill sets. Coding, um, finding access, having imaginative, creative ways of thinking, uh, finding and fixing a problem. Not to mention that curiosity. So social identity. Um, basically, the world is chaotic and confusing. We make it a lot easier for ourselves by categorizing everything. Some things we put a lot of thought into, other things we just go with, well, that looks similar to that. So we want the mental shortcuts. We don't want to use all our, all our energy up um, basically analyzing and categorizing every single thing we see. It's, it's too difficult. The human brain was, it just gets exhausted. So we put ourselves and others into groups. And these are called identity groups. So you might choose to identify yourself, uh, for example, um, there's a joke that I'm not Australian. I'm not quite sure where that joke's come from, but I'm not Australian. I'm British. I'm also European. I'm also, uh, yeah, sod Brexit. Um, I'm also, <laughs> I'm also English. Um, I'm a female. I'm quite posh sounding. Um, I don't like sports. I, I think my hobbies are just lurking on the internet, actually. Um, <laughs> which is a great hobby. I fully recommend it. Um, but yes, we, we all have these different ways that we categorize. Looking at me, you guys will have mentally categorized me somehow. Um, and yes, I do like tea. It's a wonderful drink. I don't understand why you, di you guys haven't embraced it fully. I hear there was something about Boston and a party, and it went wrong. That was Brexit 1776. Good to know. Thank you. 
Um, so, the identity groups then that we put ourselves in, they're important to us. We, we get a sense of pride, a sense of self-esteem. Um, if our group looks bad, it reflects badly on us. The choices that we make, we ascribe to our group. Uh, and we want people in our groups to have similarities to us, whether this is true or not. This is what we tell ourselves. Um, so our, our self-image is related to the reputation of the group. Going back to human factors and infosec, uh, one of the tropes that really bugs me um, is people like to say, people are the weakest link. Now, I can't say that's actually wrong, because you know what? Everyone has a bad day. Everyone makes a mistake. I remember last year, um, when I was listening to Chris talk, he, he told the story of how he actually fell for a, a phishing scam, an Amazon link, because it came at the right time in the right place when he was stressed and busy and getting organized for DEF CON, and he'd ordered things from Amazon. He was expecting emails from Amazon. He got a, an email from Amazon, and he fell for it. It doesn't matter how well informed you are, how much you're expecting it, all it needs is the wrong moment, something to go wrong. You can be having a bad day. It doesn't mean that you're not smart enough or informed enough to be able to, to, to understand. Um, so although people are the weakest link and some people really, really do need more education on it, we're also, we need to give ourselves more credit as a species. We've done quite a lot with technology. I mean, even just coming to DEF CON, you can see people being so inventive and creative. Um, Basically, I'm just being a little cheerleader for the human race. It's not all terrible. Um, one thing that's emphasized in uh, InfoSec and when thinking about human factors is the fact that the, there are very different ways of thinking. Um, so there are, is the stereotype that computing likes to be more logical, calculated, analytical, and you know, psychology is a bit sort of fluffy and it's all about emotions and talking about how you feel. I have to be honest, I don't really want to know how any of you feel. Um, <laughs> But I think you can't have just one to make um, a good security. You need a team of both. And as my slide shows, I feel that Kirk and Spock are a good example of this. I know it's slightly flawed because Spock is half human, but go with it. Um, so in terms of having the logic, you can have the most logical tool. You can create a perfect program, but as a comparison, what if people decided to make a hammer round instead of with a straight handle? Because that way it's more efficient, you use more of the tree because you cut off rounds, you hollow it out, you put the hammer on, but you've got a hammer that a person can't use. That's not a useful tool. So although it may be less efficient uh, in use of wood for the tree, a straight handle means more people can use it, more people are going to hit the nail on the head. And that's what you want. So when you're making a good tool, it has to be understood that it's for human beings. Um, and I think this is something that's coming to the front more and more in, um, in InfoSec discussions. I've been to a lot of hacking um, uh, conferences and things like that, and they're, they're more and more they're driving home. You have to think about the people. It's the, the human element that's, that needs to be worked on, really. So this might be a little controversial. Uh, I fully understand that there are very different definitions, and everyone has their own interpretations, but for the point of this talk and for simplicity, when I say hacker, I refer, I'm referring to a computer hacker and someone who has the ability to uh, access a computer system um, without permission, without admission. They can find their way around. They can be creative. Uh, I uh, put hacktivist there as well because I think it's a separate thing. Political, social um, dissatisfaction means that they're using computers for a purpose related to that. They're not just doing it for the curiosity. They're not just doing it to get access. Um, they have a, a different motive. Um, other thing, I definitely feel that a hacker is not the same as a cyber criminal. People that are doing uh, their scams in order to get money, that's not a hacker. Um, so when it comes to the hacker's social identity, it's quite uh, a difficult thing to define because of course everyone has their own interpretation. There are so many different subcategories, black hat, white hat, grey hat, ethical, skid, um, elite. There are some people that say that ethical hackers don't exist. There are some people that say skids don't exist. It all gets very subjective. Um, so hackers, they're an imagined community. This is a sociological term. It was coined by, I want to say Benedict Anderson um, in Australia when he was talking about nationalism because there were people all across Australia that were united in the idea that they were Australian. Even if they were from different ethnic backgrounds, different political views, what it meant to be Australian. So there was no 
physical or geographical connection. It's just a socially constructed community, and um, it's created through the strong interest, uh, strong choice of interest and identity. And if that doesn't fit to hacking, I don't know what does. Um, and as you can see from being a part of this, hackers create group, um, create groups. They give expertise, support, training, guidance, uh, encouragement, so much to help people get further, um, which I think is amazing. So just briefly, um, this is someone else's diagram, but I really like it, so I use it. Um, he, Seabrook, uh, broke up into five basic categories. This does not cover all definitions, all possibilities, all motivations, but bear with me. Breaking it up into these five basic categories, you can see the different reasons why people um, might get involved in hacking. Those are in the brackets around the outside. The more sophisticated the level is, um, the, the closer to the edge of the circle, and the type is by the dots. So, for example, if you hack for prestige, you're a coder, you're not doing it for any particular reason apart from to show that you are the best of the best of the best. You are doing it to prove that you can. Um, when it, and it doesn't matter what you know, the general public think, what the noobs think, you're doing it to show other people that you know who have the skills that you can do it to. Uh, recreation, people that are just you know, having a look around, playing, doing it for fun. Um, revenge, that's crowdsources, uh, insider threats, things like that. Um, profit, in my mind, that's the most boring category because it tends to just be the criminals. Uh, although I feel there should be some sort of subcategory for people uh, who are in the business of information security, but there you go. Um, and then ideology, you've got the hacktivists, cyber warriors, people fighting for a cause. So, back to the social psychology of individuals and groups. Um, I just thought this quote was quite apt from Men in Black, Agent K saying to Jay, a person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. Um, I'm, I don't think that's the entire truth, but I think it can be agreed that people behave very differently by themselves versus in a big group. Um, when it comes to the panic, uh, I'm not going to be discussing mass panic behavior changes in that because that's an entirely different thing. But you bring a people together in a group, it changes things. So for example, I'm going to say, you guys are group A, you guys are group B. I'm going to come back to that. So one of the things, more common things that you might have heard of when it comes to group changes is groupthink. Uh, it's from the 1970s. And basically, it's a psychological need to have consensus. It doesn't matter if you have to suppress disagreement. It doesn't matter if you have to ignore individuals' opinions. You, you don't um, look at all the information, but you want consensus. You want agreement. Um, symptoms of it are the group thinks that they're invulnerable regardless of the reality. Um, they collectively rationalize their decisions, uh, even if there is evidence to the contrary. Uh, they you know, disregard that. Um, they have stereotyped views of different groups rather than you know, looking at what they're actually made up of. Uh, there is the group pressure to conform, and uh, people tend to self-censorship. So even if they don't agree, they will suppress their own views. No one else has to say anything to them, but to stay in the group, they will stay quiet. Um, group think's been found to be more common when the groups are tightly bonded, more cohesive, um, especially in a high pressure situation. If there's a lot of pressure on, they need a decision quickly, group think emerges. Um, however, group think also reduces the possibility of success. So they come to a conclusion, it's more likely to be wrong. Um, and the pressure for agreement makes people think more irrationally, it makes them vulnerable. Uh, it's just generally not a good thing. Informational influence. So this is the desire to be correct. No one wants to be wrong. No one wants to stand up in front of a crowd like this and say the wrong thing. This is why I have names and dates in there. So I can say it wasn't me that said this. This is the study. Sources are important. Um, we instinctively look to other people to see how we should behave, um, what is acceptable, what is the norm. So, for example, if you go to the UK and you see people queuing, you queue properly. Not that that's a pet peeve or anything. Um, you get the information and news from the group. You tend to believe it because you assume that the ju you, you assume the judgment of other people's is going to be more reliable than your own. Um, therefore, the group view is the correct view. It's, you don't want to be excluded from the group. You don't want to be the odd one out. You don't want to be the difficult one. You want to be accepted as part of a group. Therefore, you behave as they would want you to. 
Similarly, you've got the normative influence, pressure to conform to the norms. So, for example, online, you have this by um, obeying the laws of a forum. I don't know if anyone's actually sat down and read them, but I go on a lot of hacking forums. I read all the rules. All of them are very similar. All of them saying, don't do this, don't do this, it's illegal, no money, no anything else, and then everyone ignores it, obviously. Um, but they say it. Uh, that's not how they behave, though. So they have the written rules, and then they have the norms. Um, so even if an individual doesn't agree with the norm of the group, they still won't speak up because they want to stay in the group. Um, it's also been found that if people express an opinion and other people say, yeah, no, I agree, then that will encourage the person to give a stronger opinion, a more polarized opinion. Uh, and there are links to groupthink and the conflict between groups. Um, also, a very important factor as to whether or not people conform to the norm, which rhymes, um, is whether or not they're being watched by a larger group. You behave better if you think there are security cameras around. This is why people have fake cameras. Um, yeah, so it's interesting how we can uh, uh, ascribe certain behaviors to other people because that's who they are. But ourselves, no, we're different, we're better. We know our motives. We judge others by their actions. Uh, ourselves by our intentions, and I just, I love this cartoon, uh, XKCD, for those that don't know, and it, but you probably do. Um, because, yeah, everyone might be thinking exactly the same thing as you. N why is no one saying anything? Why is no one disagreeing? But you don't. Why don't you? So, you're in this group. You want to stay in this group. Um, you belong to this group. Because you belong to the group, um, you want to feel good about being in this group. So group A, you guys are some snappy dresses. You're all looking good there. That's very nice. Um, so you find good things about the group, but then you have to also discriminate and find negative things about the other group. No offense, guys. I love the bunny ears. Um, there becomes a, a them versus us, just social categorization. So by putting you in two groups and saying slightly different things, you might feel more like a group than, um, than you would if I just left you all alone and not said anything about it. But just by putting people into a group, they uh, assume the group identity. If I'd said all blue-eyed people go to the left, all brown-eyed people go to the right, there would be a, a bigger group. They would be the majority. The minority might feel that it's not so fair. Everyone in the brown-eyed group could have a chair, but all the blue eyes has to have to stand. That's not fair. Why would you do that? And you can create uh, tensions um, and rivalry and competitiveness that doesn't need to be there just by arbitrarily grouping and categorizing people. Uh, stereotyping also exaggerates the difference. Um, it can also make you think that you've got more in common with another group than you actually have. Um, so groups, as with uh, giving a stronger opinion because you're in a group, they become more polarized. So you can go to more of an extreme. I think politics is a great example of this, but I'm not going to go into politics. Um, so, when you're in a group, how do you, especially online, how do you know if you're in a group or not? I mean, there's no list where you sign up your name, there's no, uh, I mean, you can actually register for forums and you can be a group member in that sense, but for example, 4chan, Triforcing, they've come up with a way to signal whether you are in or out. Um, and I, I quite like this as an example, because I think it's quite clever. Um, so the Triforce, I'm sure most people are familiar with, it's from a video game, and it's basically placing those three little red triangles correctly. If you copy and paste it, it will come out incorrectly. Um, so what they like to do is someone starts the thread with the, with the Triforce, someone copies and pastes, it looks correct until they hit submit, then it comes out wonky. Everyone can see that they don't know how to Triforce. It's uh, a way of outing yourself. Not that it particularly matters on 4chan because everyone's called anonymous, um, but in this uh, picture, in this example, someone had said, oh, here's one that you can copy and paste. Another person did the correct Triforcing to make it seem believable. Then someone tried to copy and paste, got it wrong. Everyone laughed. So there's subtle ways that you, you show whether you're in the group or not. Uh, people that are wearing DEF CON t-shirts from previous years, they're just saying, I've been coming to here for years. People with loads of badges around their neck, I'm involved in all these different um, villages and I've been to all these different talks, I've done these different challenges. There's ways that you are telling people you are part of the group. So when it comes to conflict within groups, 
why does it happen? You've got a big happy group A, why would you guys all fall out? Um, you could disagree about what's acceptable. You could say, you know, sitting there playing on your phone, that's, that's not what group A does, you need to go to group B if you want to do that. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure you should start doing that. It's, this is the conflict within groups. We've done uh, against groups. Um, so people can have different motivations, different goals. When it came to 4chan merging into uh, becoming anonymous, because the hacktivist group Anonymous, it started on 4chan, started out people trolling uh, and pranking and generally having a good time. And then some people were like, hey, let's use this for a cause. Let's do this to wind up, you know, people that we don't like, like uh, uh, Scientology, Church of Scientology. Um, and it got to a point where the original prankers were like, well, I don't, I don't want to be doing this for a good cause. I just wanted to be a nuisance. And so they had to split between the people that wanted to prank and the people that wanted to have a good cause. When a group gets too big and too diverse, it's natural that it, it falls apart to a degree. There's only so many resources around and cooperation leads, uh, can turn into competition. Um, it's also, especially in the hacking situation, um, it's interesting how people divide along what is and isn't acceptable in order to achieve the goals. So it's black hat hackers versus white hat hackers. How real it is can be hard to tell from my point of view. <coughs> Uh, one of the other things that a group process that um, affects people is impression management. Groups want to control how they're seen. They have a brand, they have a reputation, um, and they have to maintain it. They have to um, control the information that goes out, influence the perception that other people have. Um, the use of this on, in online media is really interesting. Twitter's great for it. People, some people are very, very careful about what they tweet. It has to be approved. Others. Donald Trump, not so careful, not so, I know, sorry, I said I wouldn't do politics, but it's hilarious. Um, yeah, so even, even when um, you're just coming to DEF CON presenting yourself, you are presenting yourself. There is no two ways about it. Um, also, when you come to these groups, trust. It's an interesting one in hacking communities. Oh, I, I've got so much fun with this. Um, trust requires the individu individual to relinquish control. You put yourself in the hands of another somehow. So, for example, if you've got the plane here, you put yourself in the trust of the pilot. You trusted that the airline had checked that he was qualified, he'd actually done the test, he could actually fly. Everyone made it, as far as we know, so that's looking good. Um, there is also the expectation that others will reciprocate. So, for example, getting on the airplane, they expect that you will behave as a good airplane passenger and, you know, not get really drunk and harass flight attendants. Um, online, you don't get the visual cues of trust. You can't see how a person is standing, how they're talking, if they're doing shifty eye movements. All you have is what they give you. It might be a photo, it might be text, but it can be manipulated so much more easily. Um, and it's really interesting looking at what does and doesn't um, encourage trust online. One of the things is um, reciprocation of information. So if you're sat there talking to a stranger on a chat and you're telling them all about your life and they're just responding like, yep, Okay, all right. At some point you're going to think, well, either they're not interested or this is just a really weird interaction. If they start telling you things about their life, you feel a lot closer to them. You feel that there's more of a bond, there's more trust. And this is how people can be manipulated so easily. I think uh, in the UK at least there's been a big rise in dating scams um, because people are looking for these sort of connections, for friendships, and they trust. Uh, one of the sad things about social engineering is that, I mean, a lot of people, um, I really like here that they emphasize that it's not the person's fault, it's that they're not um, taught or prepared well enough, but there is an element of taking advantage of someone's naivety and, you know, good nature and their trust. Um, and, it's, and it's quite sad. But going back to hacking, um, group membership is a strong predictor of trust behavior. If you belong to the same group as someone else, you are more likely to trust them. So, for example, walking around Las Vegas, if you see people with their DEF CON badge, you might be more inclined to start a conversation with them. Say, hey, you're at DEF CON, what's your background, what do you do? Uh, I mean, because it is DEF CON, some people will be a little bit more um, wary of what they say. Um, but there's still the element of, we are in this same group, this group within the wider group of all tourists and workers in Las Vegas. Um, so the fact that you are all here at DEF CON means that you already have something here in common. 
Um, what's been interesting in the research I've been doing, in interviews I've been doing, um, when I ask about trust, everyone immediately says, don't trust on the internet, no trust, don't trust anyone. They could be a dog. Um, but how far does that actually go? How far can you actually get interacting with other people if you have literally zero trust? And when I've pointed this out to them and given examples, it's, it's been quite interesting how they found that very hard to reconcile with their idea of, I don't trust anyone. There was uh, one person I was talking to who had uh, created their own forum, and it was towards the darker side. Um, and he was quite openly talking with me. Um, and I said, so do you run it all yourself, like 24 hours a day? He said, no, no, I have admin. I was like, but you said you don't trust anyone. He was like, no, I don't trust them. I was like, but do you check what they're doing all the time? And he said, no, no, okay, yeah, I trust them to do the admin. I was like, okay, so where does the, the line of trust stop? You trust them with your website, what you have created. You trust that they will uphold the rules and the norms. So what don't you trust them with? Um, and if it comes down to you know, your personal identity, well, you wouldn't trust most people on the internet with that. So it's, it's interesting. Trust is uh, tricky. So how is this relevant to why hackers are going to hack? Uh, basically, I just wondered how many of you were really aware of all the different things that might be influencing you without you actually thinking about it. So for example, what you've chosen to wear today. If you're wearing a DEF CON t-shirt, like I said before, maybe you want to tell others you've been here um, previously. You, you know what you're doing. If you're wearing a company t-shirt, you're saying, yep, I'm a part of this company, I support what they do. If you're wearing, I don't know, a sports brand, then maybe you're saying you're sporty, I'm not sure. Um, why did you choose the talks that you went to? Um, if you've come to this talk, then hopefully you've got some vague interest in social engineering or so, um, social psychology, human factors. If you've gone to one of the really technical ones, then you're saying that you're technical. But what if you went because your friends wanted to go? Or the people that you're with? Or you just didn't want to go sit in a room by yourself? You wanted to be with other people, so you let them influence your decision? Um, have you had any disagreements with the people that you came here with? If you didn't come here with anyone, you have so much freedom, it's wonderful. Um, if you did, there's peer pressure. What if you don't want to go out and party? What if you want to go sleep? Because let's be honest, it's tiring. Um, some people probably really disagree with that. Uh, which, also, there's disagreement. Um, so there's all these different things. What keeps you coming back to DEF CON in the different days? Is it that you want to be a part of this social identity? Is it the curiosity you want to find out, you want to learn? Is it the sense of community that you want to be a part of? There are all these different group factors that keep people coming back to hacking. Um, and that's, it's one of the things that my research really aims to get into. Um, so again, how does this affect you? Well, when it comes to trust, would you trust the person next to you? Uh, <laughs> Um, not, for example, with your home address or your mother's maiden name, which I've never understood because my surname is my mother's maiden name. Um, but would you give them your wallet and go to the toilet? Yes. Uh, the person who said yes, are you sat next to someone you know? <laughs> okay, well that's... <laughs> <laughs> Married to, uh, trusting your wallet with your wife, that's... Um... <laughs> anyway, before I get my... <laughs> Before I start a domestic, um, <laughs> so when you're talking to other people at DEF CON, how much do you tell them about yourself, about where you're from, about what you're doing? I have to say I'm always a little bit worried telling people about what I do because uh, mostly uh, because I have to say, yeah, I'm here to study you. Uh, I get a mixed response to that. Um, but how you present yourself is also important. So group influence, is it good, is it bad? Um, I'm going to give a very psychological answer. It depends. It can be, it depends. Cybersecurity, they'd say it depends on what the group's doing. If they're encouraging you to do naughty bad things, then they are bad. Um, but more importantly, regardless of whether you're doing good or bad, can you recognize when you're being influenced? Um, do, you, do you actually think critically when your friends are trying to persuade you to do something that you don't want to do? Do you stop and think, well, maybe this isn't a great idea. Maybe I should just go and do what I want to do. Um, and I think this is especially important in the whole era of fake news and social media tunnel vision. Don't dismiss information from other groups. In fact, sometimes it's really useful to, to look at information from other groups, see where they're coming from. You might not agree, but you get a better overall perspective. So a little bit of self-promotion briefly. My research. Um, so as I said, I'm in the second year of a three-year studentship at Bournemouth University. 
Uh, I have no qualifications in psychology or computing, but I'm actually doing all right at this. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad this is being recorded. Um, so my research is on the psychological influence of group processes online. Uh, all the things I've been talking about, I want to see how far they go from offline to online. Because um, that's something that we're really not understanding at the moment. How psychology changes when people go online. How the human behavior changes. Um, there's things like online disinhibition. People behave differently because they think they're protected for, by anonymity because they're behind a computer screen. You can become a keyboard warrior. Uh, or in the instance of that famous YouTube comment, a Navy SEAL commando. Um, the other thing is, what is the hacker identity? Um, there is a, a lot of different opinion. But there's also a lot of um, mis misconceptions. Um, and people do think a hacker is a cyber criminal. It's not the case. Some people can hack without actually breaking the law. I don't know if they enjoy it, but they do. Um, you don't have to accept the negative stereotypes as fact. You know, the, the hooded figure crouching over a keyboard. You know what? Lots of people wear hoodies. They're damned comfortable. So what's the point of my research? Um, I want to inform and educate, not just the general public, uh, because they, they do need it, but also people that are involved in these communities, people that might be vulnerable to influence, people that come looking for a sense of belonging and then are at risk of manipulation. Uh, they had it in Anonymous, where there were people that uh, got prosecuted for taking part in the DDoS attacks. They later said they were told to download the software, click the button. They didn't really understand what they were doing. I mean, partly that's their fault because don't trust people on the internet. But there is also an element of they were being manipulated. They were, wanted to be a part of a cause. Um, they wanted to do something worthwhile. They wanted to help. And people took advantage of this to use them basically as cannon fodder. Um, I also think uh, we're raising a generation of coding. There's so much emphasis on computer science, learning, all of these things. Um, we also need to teach the younger generation responsibility for your online behavior and your online actions. It's not disconnected from the real world. There are consequences. You can end up in jail for something you tweet. Um, I think it's also really important to uh, emphasize human factors in cybersecurity. It's not just about the programs, it's about people. Um, I think there's a definite need for informing policy and legislation. Uh, possibly this is me just being cynical, but I don't like the idea that governments and corporations would be in charge of the internet, because as we all know, he who controls the internet controls the universe. Um, or was that? Yeah. Anyway. Um, and I think that research such as this, it, you can go with evidence and say, you know you think that all the bad people are doing this? Here's what they're actually doing. They're creating things to um, help locate and find people that are trafficking children. They're doing good things. It's not all devious evil just because you don't understand it. Um, the last, latest thing to really annoy me was um, Theresa May's uh, words about encryption and how she wanted a back door. And I think you just don't understand. You know, it's not, there is no back door that only lets in the good guys. Um, and finally, I think it's really important for cyber soci sociological knowledge to be expanded. It's, it's new, it's interesting, and I'm sorry, but you guys are a really fascinating community to do it with. Um, so how does the internet change the behavior? I've already been able to write a paper on how to go about this sort of research, how to expand it. It's bizarre, um, but that this is such a new area. How am I doing my research? Uh, well, I lurk on forums a lot. I don't know if I've mentioned that. Um, I observe. I come to conferences like this. I talk. I watch. Uh, I make notes. Always anonymous. Never write down names, dates, or anything like that. I do online surveys. I ask people to fill in things. And I'm currently doing interviews. So, uh, And when I'm doing all these things, what I'm looking for is examples of trust, decision making, risk taking, um, looking for similarities, differences, patterns in behavior. Uh, one thing that I really feel that is important in my research is the privacy and anonymity of hackers. Uh, I want to know how far they are aware of the group processes. Um, I'm very aware of the possibility of low participation and being trolled. In one of my um, early surveys, I had someone respond that they identified as a dolphin. Um, and when asked why they used the internet, it was to hide their flippers. Someone else also gave their sexual identity as a jar of mayonnaise. Um, I could be behind with the times, I don't know. 
Um, there's also the potential, potential risk of backlash. I'm standing up here giving all these opinions. People might not like it. They could, you know, uh, decide to prank me, dox me, whatever. So far, it hasn't happened. Um, abuse on the forums? Yes, there has been some of that. I have been referred to um, with various four-letter words, and some people have said quite mean things about my mum. But she has assured me that they are not true. <laughs> the data I'm collecting has been through online surveys. I've get, got really good responses from them. People have asked uh, questions about it. They want to know about the ethics, why I'm doing the research, what it's going to be used for. Some people are obviously very cynical that my research can be used to infiltrate groups by um, um, agencies and law enforcement and things like that. The trouble with research is once it's out there, it's available to everyone. It's not my intention. I don't like the surveillance state, um, but it's a risk. So, just briefly, I'm going to share some of my initial results that I've got so far. Um, I did an online survey across 30 websites and subreddits. I had over 150 responses, which I thought was pretty good, considering that not everyone wants to tell a researcher everything they do online. Um, four forums banned me entirely, but they were forums related to cracking, so I get the feeling that they didn't really care about uh, anything that I might want to say. Uh, unsurprisingly, the majority were male, 6% female, 2% transgender. Um, the age range was 16 to 63, which I thought was a pretty good spread. One thing that I think is often overlooked is that there is an older generation of hackers. Hacking and computers have been around for 30, 40 years. Some people don't stop. Some people just get older, have families, children, legitimate jobs. They can still enjoy hacking. Um, so the stereotype of teenagers messing around in their room, true to a degree, but I think it's uh, missing the point. The average age of all the people that took my survey was 30. Um, so I don't know what that tells you. Millennials. Um, so hopefully you can see this all right. One of the questions that I asked um, was, do you consider yourself a hacker? Bearing in mind, every single forum or subreddit I posted this on, I had found through searching for hacking, cracking, coding, um, white hat, black hat, skids, all these different things, as many different variables as I could think of, everything was related in some way to hacking. Over 150 did the survey. 52% said that they, they would say that they were a hacker. Just over half. I found that really interesting on these websites specifically for hacking. Most of the people, um, just under half the people, didn't think that they were a hacker. Um, so, of the people that said yes, that 52%, I asked them to categorize themselves further. Um, so, grey hat, white hat, cyberpunk, hacktivist, other, I disagree, uh, black hat, script kiddie, elite, and cracker. Um, to be honest, I thought I disagree would have more um, responses. Oh, just to say, uh, they could select more than one option, so please don't try and make sense of the percentages. It's the percentages of that uh, number of participants, not of. So, obviously, a lot of people categorize themselves as a gray hat as well as other things. Um, that's kind of fascinating for me because that's such um, an ill-defined thing. Black hat, yes, you can say black. You do nefarious things, dark. White hat, you have to be ethical, pure, everything else. Gray, it could be anywhere in between. You could be bang in the middle. You could be just a shade lighter. What does it mean? What are they actually um, categorizing themselves as? Um, so I also did a couple of questions on privacy and anonymity. Shockingly, people in hacking communities think that privacy is important and it should be protected and they take precautions with it. The same with anonymity. Anonymity is an important feature of the internet. It should be protected and they take steps to make sure that they are anonymous online. Then it got a bit more interesting. Online security should take priority over personal privacy. There was a mixed feeling about this. Uh, and then I asked if people try and find flaws and weaknesses, and a lot of people said yes. Now, this next slide, when I um, presented this to the computing side, um, <coughs> they, they had more of a surprised reaction. So, I don't know how well you can see, but the blue lines um, are that the weaknesses and flaws should be exposed. The green lines are that they should be exploited. Bearing in mind the idea that all hackers are bad and evil and do bad things, 
it's very surprising that actually a lot of them, the majority, say that they should be exposed, but exploited, there's not a strong agreement there. Um, so it's obviously not as black and white as people would like to believe, which ties in nicely with the grey hats being the highest category. So what am I doing next? Um, I'm conducting interviews with volunteers. If anyone would like to volunteer, then that would be super. Um, if you think I've said something really ridiculous, tell me, but tell me why. Don't just send me messages saying that you think I'm an idiot. That's rude. And I've been taught not to be rude. Um, survey, my next surveys are going to focus more on trust, decision making, um, how people work in groups. If you think there's something I've overlooked, tell me. I can only do better research, which will go out to the general public, if people help me. Um, and, of course, I'm always going to lurk more. Um, so, my conclusion for my research so far, hackers are actually interested and informed groups. Um, people want to share their thoughts, people want to improve the internet and security. I worry about where the internet is going. I like that there are people that take an active interest in making sure it goes in a fair and equal direction. Um, being a hacker, being aware of security, being aware of the risks, it doesn't make you infallible to the influence. Being aware of the group processes, you can still be vulnerable. Um, I think it's important to highlight um, the significance of social psychology, uh, especially in online communities and, I mean, social engineering, it's, it's right there. Um, and just to bear in mind that you can have different identities, different uh, motivations, but ultimately we're all in the same social space. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I have four minutes left. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? First, you say Naughty. You just said one more time. You can't then say another. <laughs> Naughty. Your research is very interesting. Have you found any interesting differences between groups in terms of values, how they see themselves, or unexpected results? Uh, so, uh, did everyone hear that? Um, um, what are the differences between groups? Um, are there any interesting results? Um, so far, when people have categorized themselves, they tend to be dismissive of the other groups, which fits with the traditional, I like my group, I don't like anyone that's not in my group. Um, the, the, most, the, the easiest, obvious, uh, most obvious one of that is black hats versus white hats. Um, it's interesting, actually. There's quite a lot of derision towards script kiddies um, in forums. That's often used in a derogative term. Um, but people still identify themselves as script kiddies. Um, which is kind of interesting. I mean, it's not supposed to be something that you aspire to, but they're still saying, yep, that's me. So I'm sure there's a lot more to come. Okay. Yep? Your, your research is quite fascinating because you are doing research. You know, like, people have done a tremendous amount of research on groups in the real world. Your research is in the virtual world. Will there be point where you compare and contrast, you know, like, how... The behaviors are very different or something like that. There's the aim to. Uh, mostly I'm using psycho social psychological theory to see if the behaviors match. Um, in terms of comparing, it's quite difficult to think of scenarios where it would be. I mean, I've had people, um, there's a forensic psychologist at my university who started talking to me about criminology and how you compare hacking communities and crime gangs. Uh, and I was like, that's not, that's not quite what we're doing here. Um, so I think there's definitely a research area there, but you've got to be careful with it because you could go down the wrong track. Yep? Uh, did you make an attempt to cross-check your uh, data that you got from surveys with non-survey based data to be less subjective? The trouble is there isn't a whole lot of data about hackers. You guys are kind of secretive. Um, I am, I, I am trying, um, and there, is, there are various other studies out there. There was a paper from a few years back where people had uh, done data collection here at DEF CON. It's a terrible paper. Um, I'm not going to say what it is, actually, because I'm still being recorded. Uh, 
But no, I disagree with their methodology. I disagree with their conclusions. I think the whole thing was very poorly thought through. Um, and that's the trouble with even when you can find other data is that it might not actually have been as well done as it could have been. Uh, one more question? Yeah? So my focus is the purely online, but I ask about offline extensions, uh, and I treat it as such. So I ask how they got into it, whether they were introduced by an offline connection, or if they made the offline connections through the online. Uh, so I try and find it out that way. Um, I think that's it. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to come find me, or all my contact details are up there, and I love getting messages. Thank you.